1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things are and through whom we exist. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Isaiah 64, 7. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are potter. We are all the work of your hand. This is the word of God for the people of God. And it's about our beliefs, our doctrines, our creeds, the things that we say we believe about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, and about the church. So we're going to take them one at a time, one week at a time. And uh, I want us to sort of lay the framework of why, why we care about what we say. Um, in part, it's because what we believe the doctrines that we hold, the theology that we claim, informs how we interact with the world. I mean, the songs that we were singing this morning are a great example of sort of claiming if God is a good father and we are deeply loved, that we just sort of hold on to those and those become our base, that God is good, that God is loving, that God is kind, that we are loved, that we are valued, that we are important, that we don't have to argue for that, we don't have to fight for that, we don't have to prove that. We are loved in who we are just as we are. There's different theology in each of those songs, and the songs are part of how we learn and uncover what it is that we believe. It's part of how we teach the faith. So the creeds are are the sort of keel for the Christian faith. And the two most well-known creeds are the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. You can find them in the beginning of our hymnals. You can read them there. How many of us grew up reciting one or the other in a tradition maybe that said it every Sunday? Yeah, so we know it. You like you grew up reciting them both? We, we did not. Um, <laughs> but we are going to do one. If you know it, I want you to go ahead and say it. Um, for some of us, it's really that common. It's ingrained in us because we said it every Sunday, maybe for decades. And for others of us, we have no idea what we're talking about. So I want us to say it and hear it so it's sort of there as our base. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So the creeds came from a lot of debate. People died over figuring out what should be included in the creeds and what should not be. There were these big council meetings to decide what was in and what was out. And in the early centuries, 300s, 400s, there was a lot of contention because the Bible wasn't written like we have it written, right? It's before the Gutenberg press. Nobody's like fully, the communities aren't fully literate. You have particulars who read it, people who memorize the scriptures, people who pass them down, but it wasn't as universally accessible as the Bibles are, the scriptures are, the creeds are today. And so you have these pockets of churches and what happens, but people do people things and they start deciding stuff. 
dictating, well, yeah, no, this is this belief, and that is that belief, and that is that belief. And then some people were like, wait a minute, that one's way out there. And how do we sort of rein people in? We need a common core. And so the creeds sort of became the common core. They became that sort of fundamental piece that we could push people back to and look to and sort of look for accountability. And that has been largely adopted by the church. As a mainline Protestant denomination, United Methodism claims both the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. Um, we hold to them. We believe in them. If somebody says, well, what do Methodists even believe? We believe those things in common with all the other Protestants. Those are sort of the core. Now, what you believe as a particular individual United Methodist, that's up to you. Just like my own beliefs are up to me. But if you're looking for the touchstone, the beginning place in the conversation, the creeds are a really healthy and vital and important part for us. There are other places to start in the conversation with what we believe in God. We can listen to the faithful. We can say, well, what do other people believe about God? And if I were to say, who is God? How do we define God? What do we believe about God? What might you tell me? God is, God is love. God is, God is good. God is merciful. God is forgiving. God is grace-filled. God is omnipotent. God is a lily of the valley. God is omniscient. God is mysterious. God is powerful. God is imminent. God is transcendent. All of those things are doctrinal, theological, creedal statements. They inform and shape our belief systems, and we can pull on any number of those. And if we talk about, well, where do we pick them up from? Well, one starting place is the scriptures. Like Wendy read for us this morning, those are just three examples. There are hundreds of scriptures, not surprisingly, that point to the nature of God, that define God. God is like a mother hen that takes uh, God's people under her wings. God is wind. God is breath. God is strong. God is powerful. All of those things are part of what we believe. And so what do we do with those things? Before what we do with them, we're going to go to this, the other place that we primarily learn them, which is our songs. The hymns don't just proclaim the faith. They don't just sound pretty. They teach the faith. And if we dig into them, we can sort of start to find those particular claims that we have about God. So in the first service, we sang one of them, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Those are theological claims. We believe God is immortal, invisible, and God only wise. Or we could try another God of grace and God of glory on thy people, pour thy power. Those are theological claims. God of grace, God of glory. God has power to pour out. Those are each statements of what we claim within our faith. The songs that we've been singing this morning, those also have claims of faith. So... What do we do with those things? Well, we learn them. We practice them. Um, I had one colleague tell me almost two years ago now, a clergy person in the valley, and he said, you know, every Sunday I went and I taught people to sort of maintain their beliefs. The same thing over and over again. And that's what we all do is what he said. And I went, oops. <laughs> Apparently, I failed that assignment because I don't think that it's my job to teach you to believe just these things and to sort of keep us just on this one base. Nobody can veer. I think my job is to help us engage in the conversation. So that's my hope with this series is for us to look at the doctrines and not just say, well, what is the church historically believed or what do we believe today or what do you believe, Pastor Debbie? But for us to ask questions and dig in and do some deconstruction, breaking apart so that you can decide for yourself. These are some of the things that I want to believe. These are some of the things that I can say plainly and clearly. Yes, I believe. And maybe these are some of the ones I struggle with. How many of you saw Pastor uh, Henry's devotional on Thursday, the pause and ponder that went out? There's no harm if you didn't see it. Um, and no judgment there either, but it is worth listening to, especially as we get oriented to this series to talk about his process of evaluating which scriptures am I holding to, which songs am I lifting up, how am I expressing and claiming my faith, and my hope is that we will be excited about doing that work ourselves, that after these, you're going to go home and put paper um, and put, use 
pen to paper or keys to keyboard and write out maybe some of the beliefs that you've been taught, some of the ones you inherited. You don't have to argue with them just yet. But you can say, you know, God is mysterious. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is loving. God is kind. God is grace-filled. Put those down. And then, then becomes the work of unraveling pulling the thread and seeing where it takes you. And we're going to do a couple practices here in um, worship together, but I want us to be engaging in the dialogue. And I will say that engaging in the dialogue, asking the questions, pulling the thread can be a little bit scary because with the thread and with the questions become paces of doubt places of question. And we go, well, if I don't believe that about God, then what? If I can't hold that, then what? If somebody knew that I'm questioning this doctrinal belief, then what? It can feel very disoriented. It can feel very um, insecure. And if you go and you start asking questions and you start to feel that insecurity and that disorientation, I want you to know it is 100% normal. It's healthy, it's important, you are not alone. And when it feels like you are just getting to the edge of the cliff and if you ask one more question, you are just gonna go sailing over the other side and you are never coming back, let me say I am a living witness to tell you that is not so. I've done more than my fair share of deconstruction in my life. As a regular question asker and as a critical mind, I am rarely content to just be complacent with what you tell me. Even if you are the preacher or the pastor, you could be the bishop or the pope. If you say, Debbie, this is what you're supposed to believe, I have 15 questions to start. That's my nature, and so I've done this a lot, and I come to another side. And I'm going to tell you at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you some of my statements about God the things I can claim. So despite my wrestling, despite my questions, despite all of that undoing, Yes, I stand here as a person who believes in God, who believes in Jesus, who believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that and sort of go through it together. When I was in seminary, it was a three-year degree, and the first year, I would say, is dedicated to deconstruction. And, And it felt like Every theological claim you have is a pane of glass, a colored glass. They're pretty, right? Different colors, different beliefs. You know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the incarnation. I believe all those things were just these panes of glass. And uh, seminary professors, I should have brought my toolbox, um, like to take a hammer and just take a good solid whack at each of those belief systems, and they just shatter in front of you. And that first year of seminary is very, very disorienting because you're like, what what do I do with that one now? And what do I do with this one now? And, And they're dangerous because you go to pick them up. And what happens when you pick up cut glass is sharp. You can get cut. So you have to be very careful. The good news was that second and third year are dedicated mostly to reconstruction. So I came out on the other side of it. But the thing that I found is with all those things in pieces and with each pain that was broken, you might take a single theological view and there are different historical um, truths, different doctrines that are all about your Christology, what you believe about Jesus. And when you break them apart, then you see they're actually separate things. And so then I was able to pick up one particular thing about my Christology and one particular thing about my soteriology and one particular thing about my pneumatology. Those are all fancy theological words um, about Jesus, about saving grace and about the Holy Spirit. That's what those words are. And then I started to put them back together and I had a much more dynamic picture It was no longer a single color, but now it was more like stained glass. It was more like a work of art, and it was more mine because I wasn't just taking those pieces as what people have taught me and what I learned in the church, but I was claiming them as my own and finding my own framework. So um, my hope is that if we can do that together, and what I want you to know is that there are no questions off limits, and I'm happy to be a conversation partner And if it feels scary, that's normal. So we're going to do three examples. 
Yep, we're going to start with Susie over here. Um, a song that I think most of you know the chorus of. I sang it at church camp a lot. It's on the radio. It's from the mid-80s, late 80s, so it's like 35 years old. It's a modern song um, that no longer constitutes modern because now it's almost 40 years old, but that's beside the point. Uh, if you know it, the words are going to be on the screen. You can sing it. If you don't know it, it's okay. You can just listen to it. We're going to sing that chorus twice through. So this chorus is fairly well known and it's fairly likable. We can look at the theological uh, claims that are in it. Eric, if you would put those words back on the screen for us. We can look at those theological claims. Our God is awesome. God reigns. God is in heaven. God has wisdom, power, and love. And you could also pull from the particulars of this chorus, God is he. So we've got a few claims in there. We could argue with any one of them. We could sort of pull them apart. We could ask the questions. We could do the deconstruction and the dissection. That's actually not where my joy is this morning um, because I think that's fairly safe. But the interesting thing is, so this song came out in 1988 and it has a verse and a pre-chorus that go with it. How many of you know the verse? Maybe. Uh, for those of you that know the verse, how many know that it's not really published anymore? It was it, Even in our faith, we sing our black hymnal that you don't have in your pews, but that's pretty normative across the denomination. It has awesome God in it. It only has the chorus. It does not have the verse and the pre-chorus. If you Google it, you will find the chorus. Likely not the verse and the pre-chorus unless you type in awesome God lyrics verse. And then it'll pull up the verse for you. Here is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the verse in the pre-chorus, and then we're going to sort of break them down. So when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of even. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. So the chorus has a lot that we can sort of, we're okay with that. Are we okay with this one? I've already been called a heretic, so it's okay if you claim that you're not okay with it. Um, not this morning, just historically. Uh, I want us to look at it. Anybody struggling with the words of the verse or the pre-chorus? What do we not like? The whole judgment fist. Yeah. If I tell you that I, as a woman, am going to roll up my sleeves, what do you imagine I'm going to do? I might bake. I might go do the dishes. Right? We've got some gender norms that cloud our vision on these things. Rick, would you stand up? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, if I tell you, some of you don't know, this is my husband, Rick. If I tell you that he is going to roll up his sleeves, what do you think he's going to do? <laughs> Get up on the roof. Some of you saw my Facebook pictures. Um, the answers in the first service was he's either going to work or he's going to battle. The connotation is very different between men and women and our cultural norms and expectations. But if we look at those words from that verse, God's rolling up his sleeves and he's got thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists, those definitely point us towards the battle, right? That there is something um, wrong here and God is going to fight. This is a very authoritarian, disciplinarian view of God. And that came under critique. It was popular for probably 10 or so years, maybe even 15. And then all of a sudden in the early 2000s, they were like, nah, nobody wants to sing that anymore. Uh, 
because it, it's troublesome. It's, it, for some of us, it's just kind of meh. Um, for others of us, it's really troublesome. But there's a couple of questions that we ask in deconstruction, at least as a base layer. The first is, is it scriptural? Is there a biblical foundation for this claim about God? So if we're looking at those words in particular, when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't putting on the reds. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Is that scripturally based? Old Testament. The answer is yes. There are scriptures that are the foundation for these claims. So if it's scripturally based, does that mean that we have to claim it and believe it for ourselves? No. Or at least we hope not. So does that mean that the things that we don't like, we just simply take them, crumble them up, and say, well, I don't like that, so I don't have to believe it? I mean, it's possible, right? We do it all the time. I don't really like that one, so I'm just going to ditch it. There's actually a bit of process and integrity that you can employ if you want to that says, okay, well, let me hold this particular belief in light of other beliefs that I do have. So for me, a core belief about God is I believe that God is love. And I believe that God's love is for all people. And yes, I have scriptural foundations for that belief that God is love. And so when I hold up God as love with a God who is this angry authoritarian, there's a discord there. They don't quite line up for me. And so then I have to ask, which theological claim is a higher priority for me? Which one do I think is more powerful, more weighty, more important? For me, God is love and loving is a more significant uh, and universal theological claim, which means for me it trumps this other one. It stands above it. It may be different for somebody else. For somebody else, they may be able to hold them in sort of universal tandem. Other people may weigh it differently. But I think it's at least important for us to sort of ask the question, one, is this based in Scripture? Two, does this align with other theological claims that I hold to, that I find scriptural and theological support for? So that's sort of the work that we do. And it can be a, a really interesting endeavor to sort of dissect the music that we use within worship. So that's in the hymnals, that's modern music, contemporary, whichever generation you want to talk about, looking at the statements of faith that are included there and sort of pulling apart. There are some churches that won't use any hymns that have male gendered language for God because for them, that's a claim that they are no longer comfortable with. And that's our second example we're going to sort of dig into uh, is the language around he and father. Some people, not generally us, those Christian people, the other ones, right? <laughs> Some people say that this sort of gendered nature, gendered language about God is a new debate and is just sort of fluffy. That's not true. It's not a new debate. It actually dates back to the beginning of Genesis and the creation stories. And it's a much bigger argument than pronouns or gender norms or any of those things. It dates to the, gen uh, to the creation story. So within Genesis 1 and 2, there are two different creation stories. Do we know this? Two creation stories. If you're studying the scriptures, what you'll find and uncover is that uh, academics believe that there were two different authors and those stories were later brought together within the book of Genesis, but that there was one, the J author, and one, the E author, and they had these two different stories of creation. The one is that God took some earth, took some dirt, created Adam, blew air into his lungs, and then from Adam, God took a rib and created Eve. And within that creation story, some folks not me, like to say, well, then Adam is first, Eve is second, Adam is whole, Eve is part. There's a whole theological conundrum that we're not going to get into today. Just know I'm not a fan. Um, Genesis 2 says, in the beginning, they, 
plural, meaning God, they created them, man and woman. In their image, God created them. So God is sort of more than one. We understand it often as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, uh, created men and women at one point in time and in God's image. So if we take that scripture and that theological claim, what we're pushing on is men and women are equal and that we are both all a reflection of God. So if I'm created in the image of God and Rick's created in the image of God and everybody's created in the image of God, then what that says is that God is more than just a man, right? If I am a reflection of God, then somehow God has to also engender those qualities that I have and that you have and that sort of divergence. So the question about is God male or female goes back to that early creation story and how we understand God. And then there's a whole other debate about does God have actually have human form, God the creator? Is God anthropomorphic? Um, Does God have a body or is God just essence? What is God? How do we define that? And does God have really female or male? And are the things that we attribute to men or women, are those really properly gendered? Okay, whole other discussion we're not getting into. Um, But know that there's a problem there. And so when we look at language that is exclusively male about God, what do we get? But sort of a hornet's nest of exclusion and who's not participating and what is this reflection of women that's not there? Um, and then when we get to the conversation about God as father, which is related but also separate, we have this other conundrum, which is as human beings, we use our life experience to be the lens through which we view God. We can't help it. It's who we are. My experience, my lens looks different than yours because of who I am and how I was raised and the people that I've known. And so we use our human lens to view God. Some of us, when we then take that language and we say, okay, God is Father, it's okie dokie artichoke. It's not a problem. I was raised with a really amazing father who had no temper. He never got angry. He was always calm, cool, collected. He was always consistent. He was patient. He was kind. He was thoughtful. He was honest. He still is. He hasn't changed. Um, All of those things. So when when I hear, okay, God is like a father, God is father, I take that lens of John Camphouse and go, cool, God's great. I'm okay with that. And then in my adulthood, I've come to know a lot more people and a lot more stories. And what I found is not everybody had a really great father. Some people had mediocre fathers. Somebody had downright terrible fathers. Some of us had fathers who were abusive and belittling and demeaning and condescending and harsh where we never measured up, where we were never enough, and some of us have suffered incredible cruelties at the hands of our fathers. And so when that's our human lens, and somebody says, now look at God, and God's a father, isn't that great? We go, no. No, that's downright awful. That's scary. That's a God that I don't want anything to do with, because that father did me so much harm that if that's what God is like, I'm out. And so the choice to be inclusive in our language, the choice to be mindful of our language, do we talk about God as father? Do we talk about God as mother? Do we talk about God as both? Do we use different language entirely about God? Is not about one singular belief system. It's about the economy of community and how we make space for one another, and how we're able to be safe together to explore the questions and figure out who God is for us and in us and with us and through us. The last example that I'm going to share this morning uh, relates to my least favorite theological claim. Last line of the children's moment song there. There's nothing my God cannot do, which relates to the fancy word omnipotence. God is all powerful. I've told you before, I'll probably tell you again, I don't like this one. And here's why. Because my highest priority theological claim is that God is love and loving. And when I take that claim and I put it side by side to the claim that God is all powerful, And then I go look at what's happening in the world. 
I go, well, if God is all powerful, what exactly is God waiting for in Israel, Palestine, in the Ukraine, in places where there is incredible poverty, in situations of abuse, where there is racism and misogyny and hate and vitriol, where was God? When I look at this claim that God is all powerful, can do anything, and I hear the news of Appalachia High School, and I put myself in the shoes of those students or those teachers or those administrators of that community, God is all powerful, God can do anything. Well, it sure feels like God didn't do a whole lot today. Those are hard things to hold together. So is God all loving or is God all powerful? And if God is all powerful, then maybe God's not all loving because how could God allow such atrocities to happen to God's children? He's both. Some of us can hold those two things right together. They can be equally balanced. Some people like me, I just don't have it. And so I say, well, which theological claim can I hold to? Which one do I see in the nature of God that I meet in Christ Jesus? Which one do I know through the presence of the Holy Spirit that's going to be that God is love and God is loving? And if that means I have to forsake God's omnipotence, I'm okay with that. But if I have to forsake God's love, I'm not sure that's a God I'm ready to worship. So sometimes this theological work pushes really hard on the claims that we're making, and we'll each come to the conversation differently. But often it's the life events and the things that are going on that force us to go back to a theological claim and go, wait a minute, what am I going to do with this one? How does this work out when there's war, when there's poverty, when there's nuclear war, when there's nuclear weapons, any of those things? What do I do with those things now? The point of this series is not to solve the riddle for you. The point is to provoke us to asking questions, to have holy conversations and dialogue that allow us to engage, and it may be unsettling. And I'm sorry if that's off-putting. I really think it's fabulous. I think it's fun because the ways that we grow to understand God more deeply, more holy, more fully, they just come more into view, and so it often can just open doors and clear obstacles for us. So that's really my hope is of what happens for us. And as I indicated, I'm going to leave you with my statement, not because it's flawless or perfect, not because it's what you need to believe, but so that you know, after all that question asking, there's a point where you can make a theological claim um, and decide for yourself, is this what I believe? Is this what I can tell the world? So this is one of my doctrinal statements. I believe in the triune God, creator of the universe, who works ceaselessly to restore and redeem us in our relationships with each other and with God. I believe God is love and God's interactions with us are defined by God's agape love. I believe we are invited to a real relationship with God in a way that shapes our interactions with the world. May we be brave and courageous. May we be curious, and may we ask the questions and pull the threads and find our way to greater clarity about who we believe God to be. Amen.